On the 4th of March, 1789, the United States Constitution went into effect when the first U.S. Congress came together to meet for the first time. However, the Congress was unable to actually vote on anything until the first week of April because it didn't have the necessary number of members to be quorum. First of all, I just want to tell you what a great show you got. I listen to you all the time. Thank you, thank you. What do you want to talk about? Hey, did I tell you guys I got a coat? Today my resolution speaks a little bit about history. I've been blessed in the 146 to have the first home, the home of Frederick Muhlenberg. Um, his 230th anniversary was April 1st. Some of you may or may not know that Frederick Muhlenberg was elected the first speaker of the U.S. House of Representatives. He was born in Trap, Pennsylvania, which is where he resides in my district, and he achieved a number of firsts in his lifetime, including the first recorder of wills and deeds from Montgomery County. Mr. Muhlenberg also built the foundation of the national government and legal system in the first congressional session, passing laws providing for our first census, naturalization patterns, copyrights, and the Bill of Rights, which he was the first to sign. Little column A, little column B. Yeah, baby! <laughs> well, good morning, good evening, or good afternoon, wherever you are, whatever you do. A lot of things happening in the world today. Most of them are far beyond our control, you might say. So perhaps it's time we took a pause and thought about life and thought about the laws of gravity. The Constitution, the first Congress of the United States, Frederick Muhlenberg, politics and or the news. Don't touch that dial. Just try to hear me out for a while. James Madison once said that the first Congress of the United States was in a wilderness with not a single step to guide us. Now, that's the guy that wrote most of Article 1. So why are we surprised that things we take for granted today were not so clear once upon a time? All right? Mm, yeah, probably. Here's how you get a hold of me. The text machine is area code 209-565-DAVE. That's text and voicemails, 209-565-3283. The email is dave at thedavebowmanshow.com. And, of course, we're on the web. Just use your preferred non-denominational web search browser to take you to The Dave Bowman Show on Facebook, Twitter, and iTunes. Ego Beberi Capula said, Ali Beverve. I drink coffee that others might live. So, the other question that I got asked the other day at my, I guess the ter- correct term is AMA, but I called it a press conference, was uh, what was it that started me? Why, why am I so fascinated by the Constitution and these people? And the answer is complicated and yet simple at the same time. The answer is complicated because there's so much to it. I mean, I, every time I turn around, I've got another reason why I'm interested in this, but But the simple reason is, is because it's our history and it's that history that makes us understand the present. James Earl Jones's great speech about baseball uh, talks about the fact that uh, in the past lets us know that things will be all right. Uh, And these particular people, as I became more and more familiar with them, I realized that much like the Constitution, I didn't really know anything about them. I didn't know anything about uh, James Madison. I didn't know anything about, I really didn't know anything about George Washington other than he ch- chopped down a cherry tree and he was the commander of the Continental Army. I mean, in, the, in a real sense, I didn't know anything about George Washington when I started out this. I certainly didn't know anything about people uh, along the way that I've met in all of this that have come to influence my thinking in a lot of ways. They have understanding of those times has caused me to rethink a lot of things that I took for granted today. I was having a conversation this morning with Alex, the news guy. He's off today. Uh, Alex, by the way, completely unrelated to this. Of course, Alex is active duty Navy. So when he can't do news, it's because he's got Navy stuff to do, and I'm not going to argue with that. So, plus, I don't pay him, so that's that's why sometimes you hear him and sometimes you don't. It's no big deal. I, I like having it, and I like the way he does it, and it gives us a chance to talk. And what we were talking this morning about newspapers and television and 
the way that newspapers once upon a time were seen in this country, this this idea that they were the bastion of free speech and that they were the protectors of of the, the, the fifth estate or whatever it was, was nonsense. Uh, newspapers were political arms of, pol- they were media arms of political parties. And that's why it wasn't unusual for a big city to have two, three, five, seven newspapers being printed because each, new, each particular newspaper catered to its political bias. And we were, uh, we were comparing that to television media later on and, so it was a fascinating conversation. Maybe someday I'll get into it. But it's those things that have caused me through the years to think about things in ways that I had never thought about them before. And, of course, it, with Constitution Thursday, which started in January of 2010, the, the reason that started and the reason I think it got me really interested in it was because of the rise of the Tea Party. And And those of you who know me well know that Pop culture is something that pop fad culture fads are something that I avoid, uh, generally speaking, like the plague. It's not that I don't like them or think they're fascinated. I just I just have this inherent thing in me that if if everybody's doing something, it makes me want to not do it. I didn't read The Hobbit in high school because everybody was. Um, when it came to the Tea Party and the Constitution, remember the Tea Party used that phrase a lot. Oh, the Constitution says the fra- the values of the framers. And I was the one that's kept asking the question, well, what were those values? What what does the Constitution actually say for that? Uh, and we spent a lot of time, you know, that that's what started me down that course. You know, okay, if we're going to talk about this, if we're going to say this is what we want, we better go figure out what it actually is because... If we don't know, you know, I had this same argument with somebody this weekend about uh, congressional salaries, believe it or not. They were talking about how uh, there was a meme that got put out that, you know, Congress didn't used to get paid. Did you know that? They used to just get a stipend um, and and that was it. There was no salaries involved and maybe we should go back to that. And I'm like, that's not what it says in the Constitution. Yeah, but when was that added? Well, it was added September 17th, 1787 uh, is part of the original document. Congress always got paid. Well, I didn't know that, but I don't like it. Well, the fact that we don't know something or don't like it, much like Paul Ryan standing on the steps of the Capitol saying, I didn't know that was in the Constitution. Well, you're a congressman. It's in your job description. There's a whole, there's a whole article there that says, well, this is what Congress can do. And you didn't know that was in there? How is that even possible? I think that's what started me was that that desire to have a better understanding of things that was lacking. And no amount of waving the flag, no amount of saying the word constitution will change that. If you don't understand it, you don't understand it. I've had conversations with family members about things, you know, government of, by, and for the people. Yeah, that's not in the constitution. It's the Gettysburg Address, so you get the idea. By the time 1788 rolled around, 17, uh, the, the elections of 1788 and the, the subsequent forming of Congress in 17, March of 1789, the nation had pretty well been established. There were now 13 states. They were no longer colonies, obviously. Vermont was rattling the cage. Vermont wanted to be a state, but there was no mechanism under the Articles of Confederation for becoming one. And so they were still kind of evenly or unevenly divided between New York and New Hampshire. Maine wanted to be a state, but, you know, uh, it had almost derailed the ratification of the Constitution because it wanted to be a state, as did Kentucky. Kentucky almost derailed, by, by extent, Virginia caused, almost derailed the, the ratification because of Kentucky's delegates wouldn't necessarily support it because there were a lot of issues that were related there that they didn't feel like the Constitution was going to, uh, to meet. We have this image of the United States in 1788, 1789 being the United States of America. Huzzah! We've beat England. We've formed a constitution. We're ready to, you know, kick butt and take names. Nothing could be further from the truth. I've said this, I don't know how many times I've said this, this, this idea that keeps being presented, we've never been more divided, is utter and complete tripe. When, when someone says that to you, you know 
one thing about them, if you know nothing else, you know that they know nothing of American history. You, you, you automatically know that. Why? 1788, 1789, as we got ready to join, as the first Congress was sitting down, getting ready to start, this was the, you've seen the maps of the red and blue around the country. We didn't have red and blue in those days. We had green and yellow. I'm not kidding. This was the green and yellow map of the United States as it was politically divided after the first congressional elections and the first presidential election of 1788. Now, remember, two of these states don't even have, they don't even, they haven't even ratified the Constitution yet. North Carolina and and Rhode Island have not ratified it yet. And so the dividing line here is Federalist and Anti-Federalist. It is green and yellow, green for Federalist, yellow for Anti-Federalist. And you can see that there is a significant part of the country that the purple stuff doesn't really count, except in a couple of areas, the, the western part of North Carolina, the western part of Virginia, which is Kentucky, and a little bit of Vermont up there kind of counts. But as a general rule, those areas, because they aren't really settled yet, they don't really count. So you have this very fierce divi- division between Federalists and Anti-Federalists. It's also interesting that Georgia is almost entirely Federalist. I mean, remember, their reasons for ratifying were somewhat self-serving. And if you'll notice, it's the large urban areas, of which there are not a lot at this particular point in the United States. Boston, Philadelphia, New York, um, Charleston, and that's about it when it comes to large cities. And even by, uh, by the standards of today, well... Silverdale's probably got as many people today as as maybe Charleston had in that time. And these weren't big cities. I mean, 30, 40,000 people were the urban centers. And you can see that the urban centers and the coastal areas really liked the Constitution from a Federalist standpoint. But the farming areas, not so much. Kentucky had issues with the... Uh, with the, with the whole uh, thing in uh, uh, the, the Mississippi River and so forth and so on. So this idea that somehow or another we were this united country that was going to just all shake hands together and sing Kumbaya and gather together in, in 1789 as Congress began to, to operate is, is laughable. I mean, it really is. Again, it's something we take for granted. The idea is that the country was united was far-fetched at best. I mean, the the truth of the matter is that in the late 1780s, in, the, in that era, Americans did not think of themselves as Americans first. They thought of themselves as Pennsylvanians, uh, New Yorkers, uh, Georgians, always first. Even Patrick Henry's great speech during the revolutionary buildup notwithstanding, uh, Patrick Henry at one point had announced, I am no longer a Virginian, I'm an American, as part of the buildup to the revolution leading to this. But, but there was a distinct dislike of the difference in culture and politics and behaviors. There was a, a man from Georgia, who, or, or a man from uh, Connecticut, who actually ended up living in Georgia during this time frame, and even he was appalled by the people in Georgia. He just didn't think, he, he referred to them as, this is funny, he referred to them as much like Rhode Island. They're, they're as depraved as Rhode Islanders. They really are. And it was, it's kind of funny when you think about it because they didn't like each other. They didn't like each other at all. And there was a lot of distrust towards one another as, as the nation began to build itself into, uh, into a functional government. Now, this particular building was part of the tension, as it were. Southerners, New York, Northerners didn't really like Southerners. You had the whole issue of slavery, folks. Remember, that had gone on for a long time, and slavery was seen as a division in the nation. There were people that were abolitionists then. There were people who tried to abolish it then. There was no means of doing that yet, legally or otherwise, and literally from the day from day one, even during the convention, the South made it clear, Southern states made it clear, particularly South Carolina and North Carolina, had made it clear that 
if anybody tried to mess with slavery, they were gonna they were just looking for a reason to secede from this whole thing and to go their own way. They didn't trust the North. They did not trust uh, New Yorkers. They didn't, they didn't trust Pennsylvanians. They didn't trust anybody up, up north of the Mason Dixon line. They were suspect of everything that was done. And when the first Congress met in New York City on that that brilliant March day that turned into April before enough people showed up to to actually have a quorum, they met in this building called the Federal Hall in New York City. It's in uh, Lower Manhattan today. Uh, the build the original building is gone, but there is a, a a memorial to it there. And they met in this particular building, which uh, George Washington had had Pierre Lafont remodel. Now, Pierre Lafont, for those of you who don't know, a Frenchman who became enthralled with America, much like the Marquis de Lafayette, and uh, moved to America and became an American. He referred to himself as Peter from, from, from the time he left on. He was a fantastic architect. He is actually the man who designs, lays out the layout for Washington, D.C. later on. He's that that impressive as an architect, that impressive as a, uh, a designer. And so it, it's LaFont to, that is tasked with remodeling this particular building. And he does so in what will become known as the federal style. And if you look at a lot of federal buildings, you'll notice that they have, particularly those that are not modern. I mean, if you walk down here to the Norm Dix building in Bramerton, you're not going to get this. But as a general rule, you get what's called the federal style of architecture. And it's LaFont that, that designs this, starting with that building, Federal Hall. But he does such a magnificent job with this building. This, this building actually becomes one of the first flashpoints between northern and southern congressmen for the United States in, 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 in its very design and existence. Why? Well... Pierre LaFont, Peter LaFont, let's uh, give him that, does such a magnificent job that he turns this building into the Taj Mahal. I mean, he really does. It's, it's an amazing thing what he does. Washington loves this building. He's inaugurated in this building. The, the, the people of New York love this building. It has become just, a, a, just an amazing place. And Southerners, the Southern congressmen that come to this building, Southern senators and Southern uh, congressmen come to this place, and they see it as intentionally designed to entice them to want to stay in New York City. Remember that the location of the national government has not yet been determined. And there is a strong belief in the southern states and the southern uh, Congress people that if they allow the capital to remain in the northern part of the country, that both Congress and the presidency will be dominated by the North. And again, while we take it for granted today, in 1788, 1789, wasn't quite so clear that that was going to be the dividing line. So, what ends up happening? Well, they're going to meet in this hall. They're going to end up having three sessions uh, for this particular Congress. And two of those sessions will be held in that federal hall before the Southerners will throw such a hissy fit about it and just make it clear that they don't like all this comfort. They don't like all this magnificence. They don't like all this, this fancy dancy stuff, not because it's not nice, but because you're trying to trick us into staying here. You want to make this so nice. We won't want to leave. We can't have that because we, we don't want to leave. It's, it will literally force Congress to move to Philadelphia as a compromise measure before moving on to Washington, D.C., what will become Washington, D.C. The House is uh, lined up like this. There are 59 congressional seats. The Green are uh, what we will call Federalists, although even that is not uh, the best description of them. They are, in fact, uh, what what mo- many historians have labeled pro-administration. That is, they are predisposed to support General Washington, President Washington, and his economic policies uh, as led by Alexander Hamilton. The, the yellowish-green are what are known as anti-administration, although 
even that term is a little harsh because nobody is really anti George Washington. They're really they're they're born out of anti federalism. They want a lot of changes made. They want a lot of things done. They want a lot of, and they're not convinced that this thing is even going to work at all. And because of you know where they're coming from and 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 where they're you know a lot of them from the Carolinas. A lot of them from the central areas of New York and Pennsylvania, but many from North Car- from the Carolinas, they're Southerners, and so they're not convinced that <laughs> this is going to work, especially if people start trying to convince us to stay here and start messing with slavery. The Senate, much more heavily pro-administration, as you would expect, because at this point the the senators are chosen by the state governments rather than by the election of the people. Many of the states at this point don't even have districts uh, for the for the congressional districts. Everything is at large. Not every state has that, but many of the states are at large and so you're you're going to see that kind of division line. But the Senate clearly in the in the the pocket as it were of the administration and President Washington, which is not a bad thing. It's this lineup that will It'll stay basically the same in the midterms the, the, as, as they head out of the first Congress. It'll change a little bit because you're going you're gonna to add some folks. If you look back at the House, you see there's some blank seats. They're going to add some folks from Rhode Island and from North Carolina. And ultimately, it's going to be a, a, still a slim majority, but a majority for the pro-administration forces, for the pro-administration Congress people. And so Congress has to set about doing all of the things that we, again, take for granted today. We've, if you've ever watched the opening session of a Congress, you know that it's a pretty set piece event. The very first thing they do is choose a Speaker of the House. And, and in recent years, that has become, I don't know, political theater in some ways. In, it, it, it has become... I, I, I was bemused a few years ago because uh, when John Boehner was was running for speaker and there was a lot of rumors that, you know, conservatives weren't going to support him. And there was a real possibility. This is what the media kept saying. There's a real possibility that if enough conservative votes are stripped away from Boehner, Nancy Pelosi could actually win the speakership in a conservative and a Republican dominated house. Um, that was unrealistic. It was never going to happen. But, you know, pe- people, news people got to sell they got to sell papers and they got to sell ads and they got to sell stuff. So that's why they, they went that way. Usually the choosing of the Speaker of the House is pretty, it's pretty straightforward. But remember, we've never done this before. We've never, we've never had this experience before. And so they looked around the room and they said, well, we got to choose somebody as the Speaker of the House. And oddly enough, on the very first vote for a Congress that will have numerous debates and disagreements and you've got an entire section of this Congress that believes that this Constitution thing isn't going to work in the first place, they managed to choose on the very first ballot a guy by the name of Frederick Muhlenberg. Now, Muhlenberg is a Pennsylvanian. He's from Trapp, Pennsylvania. He is the son of the the founder of the Lutheran Church in America, a guy that came from Germany. In fact, uh, Mr. Muhlenberg himself, Frederick Muhlenberg, actually went to a Lutheran seminary in Germany along with his brother. His brother, by the way, is a is a general uh, in the Continental Army, a very successful general in the Continental Army. And Muhlenberg County, Kentucky, is actually named after him. Just a little sidelight there. But uh, Frederick Muhlenberg is also a Lutheran pastor. He's a Lutheran minister. He is a longtime member of the Pennsylvania political leadership. He has been... Again, for a guy that we almost never hear about, he has been part of the Continental Congress. He was uh, a, a leader in the Pennsylvania legislature. He was a supporter of independence, and he was actually chased out of New York City by the British. Had to go to back. He had to he had to go back to Pennsylvania and and uh, into, into New York, the the country part of New York, to uh, to preach his sermons because he was chased out of there. By, uh, by the British. He's chosen as the very first Speaker of the House. 
And I can't really think of anybody more representative of the ideas of the first Congress. We, we have all of these famous Americans, all of these founding fathers, all of these people that we all know by name and all these people that we've, we've talked about for years and we've talked and we've thought about and we, we think we know them intimately from their writings and we've talked about their philosophies and their, all of this stuff. And when the day comes, they, they choose Frederick Muhlenberg to be the Speaker of the House, a, a virtual to us, no one, but obviously in, in 1788, 1789, very well known. And this was in an era before television, before radio, before mass media, other than newspapers. People would have known of him because, again, he was, uh, his dad was a leading Lutheran and he was a Lutheran in Quaker, Pennsylvania. And they would have known of his work and his writing. They certainly knew of his brother. But most of them had never even met him or even, let him, even seen him. And now here he is, most powerful man in the House of Representatives of the first Congress of the United States. And you got to wonder to yourself what went through his head when that vote was taken. I mean, sure, it's an honor, but what am I supposed to do? I mean... <laughs> We don't even have any rules here. We don't have, we don't have any, gu- I mean, we got Article 1 of the Constitution. Here's a list of things we can't do. Here's a list of things that we have the power to do. But nobody really knows what we can and can't do yet. And we got this whole thing to set up. And Muhlenberg will be the man who will lead the Congress of the United States for his first two Congresses. He will be the Speaker of the House. He'll serve in the first three Congresses, but but he'll be the Speaker of the House for the first two. And he's the man who will really do that. And he, he actually ends up doing two more things that are absolutely fascinating. Number one, he's the guy, John Adams wanted to call the presidency his excellency. It's Muhlenberg that says, no, let's just call him Mr. President. He ain't any specialer than we are, so let's he'd probably sit in German, but let's call him Mr. President. He's also the man, remember his father is from Germany. He's of German extract. He's the man that when someone proposes printing all of the United States bills, the laws, the newspaper, government projects in German, you know, so English and German, he says no. It's better that the German immigrants learn to be Americans quickly. This becomes the source of the Muhlenberg legend that he's the man that did that. Whether he did or not is up to date, but... He's the man that gets credit for it. So now you know a little bit about Frederick Muhlenberg, the first speaker of the United States, the man who has some serious constitutional challenges in front of him. I got to go. Get Take the time right now. Tell the people that matter in your life you love them very much. You'd miss them if they weren't there. Don't pass up those opportunities. See you tomorrow, everybody. The Dave Bowman Show is a Slippery Fish Entertainment production for the Podcast 99 Internet Radio Network. For more information or to complain about how the show offended you, the text or voicemail number is 209-565-DAVE. For more information about the show, log on to thedavebowmanshow.com. Hey, I'm going to go do something productive. I'm going to go watch television.